Good morning, all. I'm Pastor Mark. If I didn't get a chance to meet you or greet you yet, make sure you stop and say hi. The uh, one last plug for the intro class, even if you didn't sign up in advance, we have enough food and we have enough materials. So if you would like to join us, we would love to have you uh, come and learn more about our church, learn more about how you can be involved in this ministry and answer any questions you might have. So that class takes place right after um, our refreshment time, and it's in the room across from the cafeteria. So I hope you'll stay for coffee and refreshments no matter what, but we'd love to have you stay for that intro class as well. So we are continuing our series in the book of Micah. Micah is known as one of the minor prophets, not because he didn't make it to the big leagues, but because his book is shorter. His message from God was shorter than books like Isaiah or Jeremiah, um, some of the longer prophecies. His name literally means, who is like Jehovah? Who is like Jehovah? So as he stands before the people, they are reminded over and over again, this is what God says. What is God like? And Micah has a message about a holy God, a holy God who warns his people. And then if they don't repent, he will bring judgment on their continued sin through perfect justice. God is not partial, as we just heard in Romans. He doesn't pick people that he likes or dislikes. He brings judgment on those who have sinned and continued to sin. He brings judgment on those who take advantage of and harm others. And we find hope in a God whose merciful character forgives sin and pardons rebellion. We find hope in God's promises that he's going to show his covenant love to Abraham's offspring, the nation of Israel, and also to the rest of the world, to restore his entire creation through the Messiah's kingdom. Through his prophet Micah, God is calling Israel and people everywhere, we saw in that first chapter. He's calling people to repent of their sin and to authentically worship the one true God. What we did in singing this morning was worshiping. We exalted the name of Jesus Christ. We sang about him. But our lives are not supposed to just be a moment of worship on Sunday mornings, and then we just go back to life as it normally is, and we just kind of forget about God. It should be oriented completely about God throughout the week, throughout every day. We want to bring glory to God. We want to show people what he's like. So as Micah is sharing this message, he's saying, people, this is what God is like. This is what he wants you to be like. God points out the failures of Israel and Judah the failures of their leaders. And he calls them to act with justice, to love showing people mercy, and to humbly walk or to live their lives with God. Because of God's perfect justice, judgment will fall on those who disobey God's word. But there is mercy for all who repent, for all who come to him humbly and say, God, I've sinned before you. I've sinned against your people. Will you forgive me? And God promises that he will forgive. Ultimately, he's going to restore all of his creation. So today, as we continue, we're in Micah chapter 3. We're going to cover one chapter each week, so it's going to kind of move along. If you want to read ahead during the week and be ready for the upcoming week, that might help you a little bit. In this chapter, Micah is calling out rotten rulers and pathetic preachers who pray on their own people. This God of justice calls them to show justice to the people that they're supposed to be serving, or they will face serious judgment from God. So if you want to turn to Micah chapter 3, it's going to be up on the screen, but if you want to follow along in your Bible, um, Micah is almost at the end of the Old Testament. So if you found Matthew and then backed up a couple of books, you'll find Micah. Before I read this morning, would you close your eyes and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you that we could be together on this beautiful fall morning. 
Thank you for shining sun, for colors that are just outstanding as we see the beauty of your creation. But we're also reminded of the cycle of death and new life. And Lord, we just thank you that you give us those reminders, not only in nature, but in your word. You tell us that uh, we must die to ourselves before we can live to you. Father, as we read your word this morning, as we look into this ancient prophet uh, from Micah, I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be open, our hearts would be soft, that we would be listening intently for your spirit to speak to us, to see where we need to repent, to see areas in our lives that we need to make right with you. And I just pray, Lord, that all that we continue to do this morning would bring glory and honor to your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. So we're going to take this chapter in just little bite-sized pieces, a couple verses at a time. Micah chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And I said, Hear, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people, and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Yuck. We have a couple of hears in this chapter, so we want to pay attention to them. They are helping us find our main points. Here you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, listen up. Leaders of the tribes, rulers of the people, isn't it your job to know justice? Isn't it your job to serve the people with fairness? To judge disputes impartially? To enact laws and carry out judgments according to God's law? That's what rulers are called to do especially those in a nation that worships God. God gave them not only the Ten Commandments, but other civil laws to follow. These laws were perfect because they're from God. And God is saying, rulers, carry them out. Do it in justice. Do it impartially. Don't treat your cousin or your aunt or somebody unfairly because they're related to you. Don't make life harder for the people that are struggling to put food on the table. Don't be so horrible. Instead of being a good ruler, you hate what is good and you love what is evil. That sounds a little bit like our culture today, doesn't it? Hating the good and loving the evil. It's one thing to ignore sins and just kind of sweep them up under the rug or to leave them in the dark alleys and corners, but our culture today has re- relabeled sins like abortion a choice. You notice they don't use that word very much. They talk about it being a choice. They talk about homosexuality being an alternative lifestyle. They talk about adultery as living your best life, doing what's good for you. It's me time now. Speaking the truth about someone's gender is called unloving and repressive. Our rotten rulers, even today, seem to hate what is good and love and even celebrate what is evil. Our standard is God's word. We don't hate and dislike people for the sins they do because everyone in this room is a sinner, just like me. We sin, but we don't celebrate it. We sin and we get on our knees and say, God, forgive me. Lord, change my heart. Help me stop sinning. We don't look at sins and say, well, they're not so bad. Let's just leave them, leave them be. These rotten rulers are just rotten to the core. If you think about the Grinch song, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, and he lists all the hor- horrible things, the rotten banana peel and all of those things. That's what I was thinking about I was, as I was reading this passage. But then it also reminded me of The Walking Dead with zombies feeding on people. It's really graphic. 
the description of how the rulers were devouring their own people. And again, this is picturesque language. They weren't literally eating each other. But God and Micah are saying, how can you do this to your own people? Verse 3 says, they eat the flesh of my people. You're eating them alive. You're flaying their skin and breaking their bones. They chop them up and cook them in a pot like human stew. Ugh, sorry. But this is how awful God sees these rotten rulers because they're treating the people unjustly. He basically is calling them cannibals. You're taking advantage of your own people and you're chewing them up and you're spitting them out. You could care less. But you've been given a position as a ruler over the people. You've been asked to serve your local tribe and for people to come to you and solve problems. Think about our politicians today. Many of them go into politics with a desire to serve the people. And a lot of them continue to do that. But some of them get some power, they get some wealth, and then they start making bad decisions. And God calls them out. Verse 4 says, these leaders will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer. He won't even look at them because of their evil deeds. God won't see them anymore because they are not repenting. They're crying to God because they're being punished, but they're not repenting of their sin. Jeremiah 33 says, call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. God does listen to prayer. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. We love this verse and we talk about it and say, if only America would do this and nations around the world, if only these nations would humble themselves and turn to God, God will hear those prayers and God will heal their lands. But God knows the hearts of these rotten rulers and he knows that if they don't repent, if they don't humble themselves, then God is not going to hear them. He's not going to listen to their cries for help. Who does God listen to? He hears the humble prayer of repentance, but he doesn't listen to those who are simply crying because their judgment is just too harsh. Rotten rulers have judgment coming to them. And next in verse 5, he talks about pathetic preachers, or in his day, prophets. Listen to verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. They cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Now, about the prophets that are leading my people away from me, God says, you who are supposed to be speaking on my behalf, thus saith the Lord. That's, that's the word of a prophet. This is what God has to say to you. They were the preachers of the day who were supposed to be bringing God's message to the people. And this verse says, when they're well fed, when they're well paid, they promise peace to the people. This word peace in Hebrew is the word shalom, which is the greeting for Jewish people. They say peace when they greet each other, shalom. It not only means peace, but it means prosperity. It means success. It means wealth and welfare, a state of good health, friendliness, deliverance, and even salvation. God is offering peace to those who come to him. But these prophets told the people anything they wanted to hear as long as they were given food and given enough money. But this verse says, when they have nothing in their mouths, they declare war against them, the opposite of peace. So 
you're not feeding me, you're not treating me well, well, God is going to condemn you. God is going to judge you. You're going to get what's coming to you because you're not taking care of me. How's that for a solid preacher? Preachers today who offer prosperity, who promise success and good health, do exactly the same thing. You will never have problems if you only have enough faith and follow God, they say. You will have all the money you could ever want as long as you give me enough and just pile it up here in front of the church. Give me your money and God will bless you. And they get rich. They have golden toilets. They fly around in personal jets. The word of faith movement is growing in leaps and bounds around the world and making lots of preachers wealthy while they tell their congregations what they want to hear. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to live your best life right now if you only give enough money, if you only just believe. Do they mention Jesus? Maybe, but it's not the gospel of repent and be saved. It's not the gospel of you will have trials, you will have difficulties, but I will be with you always. I will come again for you. I will restore what I created, but that's in the future. Trust me and follow me now because I'm going to always be with you. I'm not going to leave you alone. Jesus called out the self-righteous preachers of his day, those that were known as the Pharisees. Listen to Matthew 23, 37 to 39. These are really the only people that Jesus got mad at. And it was righteous anger. Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus was warning the people that God sent prophets to Israel. There were good prophets that were sent, like Micah and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Elijah. He sent prophet after prophet with God's actual words. But the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, ignored the message and instead killed them because it wasn't the message they, didn't, they wanted to hear. The message was not peace and prosperity. The message was repent or you're going to be judged. And so they killed them. The religious leaders in Jerusalem in Jesus' day were taking advantage of the people by adding extra, extra, extra laws, making it so hard for people to think that they were pleasing God in addition to tax burdens. They allowed money changers into the temple to gouge through high prices people who were coming to worship God. They set up shops and they cheated the people who wanted to come offer their sacrifices. And that's when Jesus drove them out of the temple and said, this house is a house of prayer. It's a place for people to come worship my heavenly Father. And you've made it into a den of thieves. Throughout the New Testament, there are warnings against false teachers. People who will sneak into churches and cause division. They'll preach something other than the true gospel. Paul warned Timothy about this very thing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created by God is good. 
Nothing is to be rejected if it is rejected with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. That's 1 Timothy, not 2 Timothy. That's a good passage. It talks about false teachers. Let's try 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. Let's try looking at our notes, shall we? (laughs) Speaking of notes, I forgot to even mention it, but in your bulletin is a note sheet. If you're watching online and you go to dunkirkbaptist.org, you can find today's message, and there's an outline with some of the information about today's message. So, sorry, I forgot to mention that to you. Um, But let's try 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. It's all good stuff because it's God's Word. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul is encouraging Timothy that it's not going to be easy. You will endure suffering, you will endure difficulties, but continue to preach the word when it's the right time in season and out of season, when it's a hard time to preach, preach the word, preach the true word of God, patiently teach and correct the people in your church, especially those who have wandered from the truth, people who are caught up in sin, call them to repent and be saved. I hope that every Sunday that you come here, you hear that message, you hear the gospel, because Even if you have repented of your sins, even if you've called on Jesus Christ to save you, between Sunday and Sunday, you've probably sinned again. And you need to continue to confess that to God. Not to be saved over again, but to have a right relationship with Him. God says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to give us a clean heart, and lift us up again. So not only do we need to respond to the gospel initially, but we need to continue to recognize that we are sinners and we need to be forgiven. That God loves us, he cares for us, but he wants us to humbly come to him and confess our sins. As you think about these preachers who are preaching to people with itching ears, Does anybody get an itching ear or your ear popping and feeling really weird? Does anybody have that happen this time of year for me, especially I think with allergies and other things, I'll be doing this and just, I will probably look really weird. If you've ever seen me doing that, it's because my ears are clicking or making weird noises and there's nothing in there that I can get out. It's so annoying. You just want it to go away. People with itching ears, just want to hear what's going to make them feel better. They want the itch to go away. So tell me everything's going to be good. Tell me my week is going to be wonderful. Tell me my kids are going to love me and come every Sunday for dinner. Just tell me all that good stuff. That's what I want to hear. Tell me God loves me, no matter what choices I make. Tell me God doesn't care what lifestyle I live. Just tell me those things. I can't tell you those things because that's not what God says. Yes, God loves you, but the sins are going to eat you up. God wants to protect us from living a life that is going to destroy us, not only here on earth, but suffering for eternity in hell if we're not forgiven by Christ's blood. We need to preach the true word of God. And we also need to be really careful who we listen to on TV, who we listen to online, Just because they're reading the Bible doesn't mean they're reading it in context. Just because someone is sharing something doesn't mean it is true. So I hope that when you're listening to me, you have your Bible in your lap and you're reading along with me 
so that I'm not only in the right book of Timothy, but that I'm reading the real word of God. And that you're saying, is this true? Is this right? When you hear somebody, listen closely. Is this true or does it just sound really good to me? Make sure it's matching God's word. Well, let's go back to Micah chapter 3 and finish up this last section. There's no body parts in this one, so it's not as scary. But it's still a warning. Verses 6 to 12. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Here's the second. Hear this. Listen up. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Here's the final warning. Show justice or face judgment. Listen up, pathetic preachers. Mike is going to tell them what's going to happen if they don't repent and turn back to God. All of these messages are meant to warn the people. God's desire is that people repent and be saved. His desire is not to carry out the judgment. In the New Testament, it says God desires that all would come to him, that would trust Jesus Christ and be saved. It's not his desire to send people to hell. But that's the judgment waiting if we don't trust Christ as our Savior. Verses 6 and 7 talk again to those pathetic preachers, the prophets. It's going to be like darkness for you. No light. You will have no new messages from God. You'll be disgraced and put to shame. God is not going to listen to you because you're not coming to Him humbly. He's not going to answer you. And then in verse 8, Micah speaks for himself. As for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord. It's not because I'm making people happy with me. It's not because I'm winning popularity contests. It's not because I'm telling the people what they want to hear. It's God's Spirit that has filled me, and I'm speaking God's Word. I'm filled with justice so that I can call out Israel's sin. I see what's going wrong. And God has told me to call out those injustices. I'm not just telling people what they want to hear. I'm not filling my belly and telling them everything's going to be fine. Don't worry. God's going to protect you. That's the same call that's on preachers today. Speak the truth of God. We are here, preachers, to preach God's word, not to tell our opinions about things, not to share the news report, not to just give feel-good stories, but to share the word of God. And I believe we're here to share the entire word of God. So that's why we're not only in the Gospels where there's stories about Jesus, and it's often very encouraging. We talk about what happened in the Old Testament. We talk about what the prophets said, because all of the Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And as we read the Old Testament, we can read it through the lens of the Messiah came. Here's the fulfillments of those prophecies. That's why we're spending time in Micah, in case you were wondering why I'm reading these scary stories to you. It's because God's 
justice is serious. And he wanted to warn people about the judgment. God holds prophets and preachers and teachers of his words accountable for their actions, for what they say. Hebrews 13, 17 says your church leaders will have to give an account for they are keeping watch over your souls. And the next verse says, so please pray for your pastor, pray for your deacons. I hope you're doing that on a regular basis. So many of you tell me that you are, and it's an encouragement to me. Hebrews 13, 18 says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Throughout the New Testament, there are warnings, as I said, about these false teachers who sneak into churches and cause division by preaching things other than the true gospel. Micah warned that if you start preaching something else, God is going to stop listening to you. He's not going to bless you or bless the ministry that's going on. Pathetic preachers, cut it out. And then the rotten rulers again, listen up you rulers in Israel, you haters of justice, you people who turn good into evil, you've been building Jerusalem by the blood of the people. You rule over the people, you make judgments, you take bribes for your own benefit. Your prophets are just saying what people want to hear so that they get fat and wealthy. Sadly, they mention God and they say, well, aren't we a godly nation? Aren't we God's chosen people? Isn't God on our side? Nothing bad can happen to us, right? We have politicians saying the same thing today, trying to win votes by picking and choosing little bits of the Bible that seem to back up their platforms. And if you've been here for any length of time, you know that I don't speak politically from the pulpit. The only thing I'm going to say is, Christians, you need to vote. You need to look at the candidates, you need to look at the proposals and the issues, and you need to say, are these things of justice? Are they things that are true? Are they things that we can back up and say, yes, God would love these things to happen in our state, in our country, in our county. We need to vote according to godly principles and not just say, well, I just need to pick the person who's going to make my pocket fat as in my wallet. Take time to learn what they stand for. Take time to see if they actually do what they say. And then vote for the people with the most biblical values. And I will tell you that you're never going to find a 100% match with God's word. But I would encourage you to vote for those that are the closest. Our hope is not in a political savior. Our hope is not in America being as great as it ever was, our hope is in Jesus Christ because he is going to restore the entire creation to what it was supposed to be. And that may not happen in our lifetime, but it is going to happen. And so God calls us to find rulers that are not rotten, but rulers that are godly. In verse 12, Micah repeats the coming judgment Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Because of you, rulers and preachers, this beautiful city of Jerusalem will be plowed under like a field. Jerusalem will be destroyed and just left as a heap of ruins. The mountain of the house is talking about the mount of the temple. That was the highest point in the city, and that's where God's temple was built. And it said it's going to just become a hilltop forest, nothing but trees. The thing that you were so proud of is going to be leveled and destroyed. The people of God, especially the rulers and preachers of God, should live to glorify God to show his qualities, his character to the people that they are called to care for and to serve. And especially in this book, he keeps talking about justice. Treat the people fairly. Treat the people as though you care about them. 
treat the people the way God would treat the people. When Micah described that way of treating people, when he said, I'm filled with God's spirit, I'm filled with justice and might, justice and righteousness are highlighted over and over again because that's who God is. God is righteous. He is holy. He is just. And he expects his people to live that way, to show justice or face his judgment. Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah, who was a contemporary of Micah. He's writing to these same people and warning them. When Jesus went to his own hometown of Nazareth, listen to what he said in Luke chapter 4. He quoted the prophet Isaiah. Luke 4, 16 to 21. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. He knew his Bible. He could find the place in a scroll. Do you know what a Jewish scroll looks like? It was pages and pages and pages just rolled out. And it was going, as we know, from right to left with no chapter divisions, with no sentence divisions, with no little heading. Jesus, read here. There was nothing like that. They just handed him a scroll. He opened it and knew exactly where he wanted to go. I hope that you know your Bible that well that you can see in your head where that passage is and you can find it when you need it. It's important. Make sure you get a good highlighter and highlight key verses that you want to go back to. Jesus unrolled the scroll. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people marveled and were amazed. Jesus is the one that the prophet Isaiah had written about hundreds of years earlier. Notice this passage says that he came to proclaim good news to the poor, to bring liberty to the captives, to bring sight to the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. The message of God is a message of justice. People who are captive, people who are blind, people who are oppressed will find justice from God. But just like the kingdom that he came to establish, it was freedom from their spiritual needs first. Yes, Jesus met physical needs. He did heal the blind. He made the lame walk. He fed the poor. But the spiritual needs were his primary message. Jesus came to save those who were lost in their sins. And we saw time and time again, the people would follow him around and say, give us more bread, thanks. And Jesus said, I'm the bread. I'm the one you're looking for. I will fulfill all you need. Come to me, you who are heavy laden, you who are weary, and I will give you shalom. I will give you rest, peace, contentment. All of those things that Jesus promises are spiritual. He says, I will take care of your needs. And if you have a need, pray for it. But he doesn't say he's going to give you everything that you think you need or everything you think you want. He's not promising to make you wealthy and well-fed. He's promising to care for you. And most importantly, to save you from your sins. So this morning as we wrap up, some takeaway questions. Have you repented and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you humbled your heart to say, 
God, I know that I have not lived a perfect life. I know I can't live a perfect life. And I believe that only Jesus Christ can save me. I don't think I can be good enough to win my way to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. The Bible says, along with our faith should come good works. We should serve people because how much God has loved us, cared for us, and we serve out of that love and compassion. We don't serve, we don't do good works to gain God's approval. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can save us. So if you've never done that, if you're watching online or you're here this morning and you're close, but you just haven't said, yes, Jesus, I just need to turn this all over to you. Come talk to me after the service. If you're on, watching online, you can contact me through the church website. I would love to talk to you and show you in scripture where it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. saved. Are you in some kind of a leadership role, maybe at work, maybe here at the church, maybe in your school or in your community? Are you a godly, Christ-like leader? Do you strive to do justice, to show fairness, and act the way God does? Not showing prejudice, not showing partiality, not picking favorites, treating everyone with the honor and value that God has placed on them, seeing people as a creation of God and worthy of his love and worthy of your mercy, your justice, and your care. We need to be leaders who show justice. Do you love good and hate evil? That should affect everything in our lives, including what we enjoy as entertainment, the things we listen to, the things we watch, the things we read, the people we follow and say, I'm going to emulate this person. Is that person godly or are they evil? Do you speak the truth with love? Do you agree with what God says is true and just and right? It's not loving to uphold and to accept what is wrong, what is sin, what's harmful to people, to just ignore those things, but lovingly to say, this is what God says. God doesn't ask us to judge our neighbors. He doesn't call us to convict them of their sins. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But God does expect us to speak the truth. And he says, speak it in love. Speak it in a way that desires that person to come to Jesus Christ, to see their life made right. And he says, be ready to give an answer for the hope you have. If you're being treated unfairly, if you're being treated unjustly, maybe at home or at work, maybe at school, don't despair. Jesus is going to hold people accountable for their lives and for the way you were treated. This message has been an encouragement to people who have been slaves in captivity. It's been an encouragement to people who were dishonored and treated like garbage because they know that the God who created all of this loves them, cares for them, and offers salvation to them. God doesn't promise us to take us out of every bad situation we're in, but he promises he'll go through it with us. He won't leave us alone. And we have the promise that in the end, there will be complete justice. Jesus Christ himself will judge the living and the dead. There is hope in Jesus Christ because he said, I'm coming back and I'm going to restore all that was made wrong and I'll make it right. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for sending prophets, for giving us your word to preach this message of repentance to preach this message of justice, to call us to live to a higher standard, to call us to live our lives to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would encourage us this week, that when we see injustice happening, that we would step in and we would do everything we can to make things right, that we would speak the truth in love, that when we have opportunities 
to be in a position of leadership or influence, that we would act justly to show mercy, to love what is good, and to hate what is evil. Heavenly Father, I pray that anyone this morning that doesn't know you as Savior, today would be the day that they would put their faith and their trust in you, and they would start their lives over again. New life in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He loves us, and he's freed us from our sins by his blood, and he's made us a kingdom. He's made us priests to his God and Father, to Jesus. Be all glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.